Hi everyone, welcome back to Wrong Think. With the recent and insidious growth of cancel culture and the betrayal of core liberal values on all sides of our politics, our country's stability, civil society, and institutions are increasingly threatened. This week, I sat down with my friend Camille Foster, the co founder and executive producer of Freethink and co host of the Fifth Column podcast to talk about the importance of civil discourse for a free society and to look at why an increasingly polarized America needs free and open debate more than ever. I hope you enjoy it. I just don't believe we'll ever be able to transcend racism so long as we keep reproducing um, the categories of race, so long as we believe that these categories are what's most important and cannot be Mm -hmm. transcended. The thing that we ought to be trying to encourage people to do is to think about how far they could push the envelope. Um, how, how, how close can you come? To, or what's the best version of your argument that you can make in this context that makes it likely that you will not offend other people completely and make it impossible to make progress? Camille, it's so cool to be in conversation with you. I'm glad that you're like uh, coming through to AEI, even if virtually uh, it's a place that I think your your ideas really um, would resonate. Um, you're just somebody that it's one of those friendships where I met you and it felt like we knew each other for a long time. But actually, I, I remember when I first met you, it was at Katie Royfe's house, I believe, uh, several years ago. We had known each other a bit on Twitter. But you were dipped in a very beautiful Alexander McQueen suit. Not just an intelligent <laughs> guy, but a guy that cares about style, which I think is very important. Um, yes. And when we were working on the Harper's letter in 2020 and trying to find people um, to sign the letter, you were one of the first people that I you know, immediately reached out to because I think that you just embody um, the values of civil discourse, especially um, free thought, but civil discourse, civil disagreement, trying to find productive solutions to these intransigent problems that seem to be crippling so many of our institutions. What are you thinking about right now when we when we talk about this? I mean, I'm thinking about just having had to leave Twitter, if not permanently, for at least a few months, <laughs> because I find that it's really at a place now where I find it's not just impossible to have civil discourse on social media, especially Twitter, but it's actually changing me in ways that mm. I don't like. I find myself um, so upset with the way that people um, present arguments as necessarily dichotomous. Uh, you know, you have to, if, if, if you don't think this, then necessarily you think this. And it just felt to me that it was, it was, I was in danger of becoming a less nuanced thinker and writer if I didn't, you know, get myself away from that type of interaction constantly um, provoking. Uh, me to be a dichotomous thinker in a way I don't want to be. What about you? Yeah, no. Well, I I had not remembered, but as you described it, uh, our first meeting, and I, I'm surprised to hear I was in a suit because I, I haven't worn one in a number of years. But when I do, I do try to, to make certain <laughs> that it's excellent. So <laughs> sartorial, sartorial considerations are something that we both uh, have in common. In fact, we share a lot of uh, important values, especially the ones you were just describing. <laughs> I want to come back to the social media stuff in particular and your decision to leave and, you know, how best to interact with those spaces and what they may be doing. Um, In general, as I was thinking about the prompts for our discussion today, I was thinking a lot about what what I've learned um, since the onset of the COVID era, perhaps the post-COVID or with COVID era, um, because there there are some, I think, rather important uh, lessons that I think I've been taught by experience about um, just speech and cultural norms uh, and the the kind of changing social milieu that we've all been living with, and certainly uh, the Harper's letter, uh, which you you know spearheaded um, and invited me to to join on to. Uh, we could perhaps talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, was a real indication of some changing dynamics that we all saw and we're all deeply concerned about. And I can remember being overwhelmingly concerned in certain respects, perhaps a lot more 
Um, I'll even use the word apocalyptic in this particular conversation <laughs> to describe like my feelings because it wasn't clear like where the bottom was. Uh, there, there seemed to be a real unraveling taking place. Uh, and today I'm quite a bit more optimistic about what the future holds. And at a minimum, oh really? I think I have. Oh, I think I have some some better informed perspectives. Uh, I can remember during the lockdown when I saw the protests starting to take place in 2020 and around the time we were publishing the letter, like really contemplating things and trying to figure out like what is going wrong? What is actually happening here? Why are things unraveling? And reaching out to some of my smartest friends and you among them, I'm sure, to ask, what are you reading? <laughs> what are you actually contemplating to try to help figure all of this out? And it, it gave me an opportunity, that effort, gave me an opportunity to, to kind of revisit what my own core principles are um, and to think about my core values. And uh, I mentioned kind of the lessons that have come out of this. And if I had to distill it to two or three things, uh, the first would be that it's um, that we can't assume shared values um, are, are mm -hmm. well understood. You know, oftentimes people will say, oh, free expression, cancel culture, wokeness, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not always obvious that we mean the same thing. I think that's especially the case when we talk right. about really freighted words like racism, uh, for example. Um, and then the second thing is that it's imperative to think about things from an affirmative standpoint. What are you actually arguing for as opposed to what you're arguing against? Right. Um, and it, it doesn't mean you can't be against things. You ought to be. And there are some things that I, I imagine one could be against without having a sort of for proposition attached to it. But in my own experience, um, the the best safeguard against finding yourself engaged in you know kind of reactionary behavior or advocating for something without really being able to articulate why um, is to start with the affirmative values and I actually think when you were um, asking your question or at least offering a prompt um, you did a great job of elucidating exactly what those values are with respect to ideas like free expression um, which ultimately it's the concern for free expression, this, this notion that, that uh, fallibility ought to be a norm, that all ideas are subject to challenge, that authority um, and truth is a matter of engaging in this dynamic process of disagreeing, um, and that prioritizing that over the concern that you might offend someone's feelings um, is something that we ought to prize in our institutions and in our social interactions. It is, it is literally the, the right. technology that we use to establish truth. Um, and I don't think nearly as many people as I imagined uh, have, a, have a sophisticated <laughs> understanding of that. Um, That's right. It's probably always been true, uh, but I have a better understanding of it today. And I think some of the, the kind of worst, most intimidating manifestations of illiberal stuff um, have probably, you know, faded a bit or at least lost some of the luster um, or the appearance that there is a broad um, kind of consensus in support of them. Um, that said, I think the real challenge um, to, to not be completely, you know, overwhelmingly optimistic at the beginning and say, there's nothing to talk about <laughs> is, is that there is a lot of kind of reactionary okay, we can wrap it up, yeah. and even a spiral of reactionary stuff. Um, it's interesting what you, you said about, you know, um, offense, it's because offense is a problem. And I, it's what I used to think um, was one of the big issues since 2020 or so is that like people um, are self-censoring because uh, people can take offense so easily. But more recently, one of the things that I think is a little bit more troubling and maybe why I'm less optimistic is it's not just about offense, but it's about signaling um, solidarity and um, signaling that you're on the right side of things or the right team, regardless of where um, some of the inconvenient facts might take you. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, I think the past few weeks have really been um, eye opening for me with the way that the conversation has been going down and playing out around this really tragic, um, horrific, sad um, on just a deeply human level, sad killing on the subway of a 30 year old homeless man named Jordan Neely by an ex-Marine, Daniel Penny. Um, it seems to me that this is one of those stories that we could approach through a variety of lenses if we wanted to really talk about what's going on. And one of the lenses you could approach it through would be the lens of tragedy that mm -hmm. two 
men on very different trajectories were fated to collide in a subway car. And the outcome was really um, what I don't think probably anybody, including um, the man who survived the encounter, got on the car wanting. But that's not the way you can talk about this. And even saying that already signals that you're not thinking in a certain way that mm -hmm. like um, invites extraordinary attack because the, the social media um, judges and a lot of the right thinking venues, they decided that there was a killing. It was a lynching. It was a murder. At least um, it was that, that, that Jordan Neely was killed by white supremacy. And that's uh, and the subject is closed. And to even say, well, this may not be a murder, this may very well be a manslaughter, but it, there may have been justification in an intervention, and then it may have gone out of hand, and we can talk about that, and what's the legal term? It's like, no. And I, and I, was, I, I think that actually the, the debate around this became harder to talk about in a sensible way than the stuff around Floyd and previous killings, and it really, it really, it really struck me, and that I was like, you know, I got to get off of Twitter because it's actually harming me as a thinker. Um, and, and, you know, even our elected politicians like AOC, not just to beat up on, you know, uh, on, on a specific type of progressive, but she embodies something that really troubled me about this whole exchange because the facts mm -hmm. don't matter. Um, and we know the facts don't matter with people like Marjorie, Ta Marjorie Taylor Greene. And uh, there's lots of, it's not a left right thing. There's just a type of politician that plays fast and loose with facts, but you know, the, the progressive side of things often likes to pride itself as being, you know, highly rational and informed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, AOC just says that, you know, for example, this death happened because um, Neely was unable to get uh, mental health treatment. But the Times, the New York Times reported that not only was he able to get mental health treatment, he was offered an amazing deal to get it instead of going to prison. Um, and he walked away from the treatment, but even to point that out was to be inconvenient at best. And like, what are you trying to get at was really yeah. what most people were saying, you know? And so how do you have this civil conversation when, if you even just bring up a factual matter, people say, what's your purpose here? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, you know, what do you, does that make sense? You know, no, and that's I mean, like the nice way of saying it. What are you, what are yeah. you trying to do here? Yeah, interrogation of motives is perhaps like the number one move in almost every public conversation now, or at least the, the mm -hmm. attribution of motives and interrogation of motives. Because even when they're asking the question, there's always that subtle um, or not so subtle implication that you are a bad kind of person who's harboring bad ideas for malevolent reasons, obviously. And usually with you and I, um, I frequently see that what's hurled at us is something like a, a kind of self-loathing. Um, or a tokenism, sellout for profit, right. um, as opposed to our ideas being kind of moored in principles and values that we actually hold and believe in, which I, I suppose shocks people. But um, that is the thing. It is, it is a norm that we've seen um, reinforced in some respects. And I should say candidly that I think a lot of our institutions, um, a lot of the sense-making institutions, a lot of academic institutions, um, and certainly our two political parties are kind of dominated by those kinds of ethoses and cultural mm -hmm. norms in, in a lot of respects. That is how our politics plays out. I mean, it's not enough for your opponent to be wrong about something. They are monstrously wrong, and they're probably wrong right. for a lot of reasons. They're some sort of supervillain. They're ghoulish, isn't that? Yeah. Like people, you're a ghoul. But, you but know? I don't... My, my contention, the reason for my optimism, is that my, my belief is that most people are exhausted by this. Uh, that most people aren't particularly inspired by it, um, that even um, within these institutions, there are far more people um, who, than, than it seems anyways, um, who agree with us, who share our concerns um, and our belief in the importance of particular kinds of norms than are willing to talk about it publicly. And in many instances, the question right. becomes whether or not what we're suffering from is this kind of overwhelming and inexorable um, growth of illiberalism and a commitment to it by a plurality of, of Americans. Um, and it's this is a global phenomenon, actually. A lot of what's happening here is mm -hmm. happening elsewhere, too. Um, or um, if there is a, a really severe deficit of courage, um, even if people don't know how to articulate their 
a belief in the importance of individualism over kind of race, mm -hmm. pride, and equity, or the importance of uh, they can't make you know a particularly eloquent um, defense of free speech, even of the most objectionable mm -hmm. sorts. I think a lot of people, a lot of Americans in particular, like actually have impulses around these things that are very good and very healthy. And in most other contexts, certainly person to person, like people tend to be a lot more generous. Um, and I think there are real opportunities for us to model uh, good, healthy discourse and conversation, kind of mm -hmm. like we're doing here. And have we, as we've done in other contexts as well, um, there's a market for it. There's an opportunity there and the actual trends that I've seen more recently, like the hiring of people like our friend David French over at the New York Times and John McWhorter as well, mm -hmm. joined, joined those editorial boards um, or editorial, um, the editorial team, I suppose. Um, like that's, that's a really good sign. It's healthy um, that that's the case. And I actually see more and more like thoughtful conversations happening in places and more and more people who are willing to say um, unpopular things uh, and to mm -hmm. run whatever risks are associated with that. And, and, you know, for me, there's a question of whether or not the, the risks that we're facing, the more prominent or profound risk is illiberalism in and of itself, or um, the threat inflation that often goes along with criticism of the liberalism that we're seeing, particularly mm -hmm. the, the dynamic that I see most often um, in the circles I run in uh, is threat inflation from the kind of libertarian, mm -hmm. like right coalition of what the left is doing and what's likely to happen. I heard someone uh, two or three days ago describe um, America as on a trajectory towards South Africa. And it's like, seriously, do you really think there's like a political <laughs> a constituency? I wasn't a libertarian. Um, I, I don't know who the person was. Actually, it was a, someone I saw a comment on something I posted on Twitter. And I just, mm -hmm. I didn't respond, but I thought to myself, do you, do you really think there's a political constituency for that? Um, you know, I, right. in 2020, maybe I could see you believing that because it certainly seemed like that at certain points, uh, the ascent of like Ibram Kendi, for example, and Nicole Hannah-Jones. But the reality is that those are controversial figures who have like rather mm -hmm. controversial perspectives. And there are more and more people who are willing to say so out loud. I think it's always been the case that there've been more and more people who are skeptical um, but I think the deficit of courage is probably a more active threat to uh, a free society and to, to free expression um, than liberalism narrowly as a, a kind of cultural, as a cultural. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was something to your point, speaking of the New York Times this week about uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, mm. uh, the the the. the decision makers within institutions kind of reevaluating what they're doing with those programs and changing the emphasis towards belonging so that, that everybody can kind of participate, including, you know, people that uphold the status quo, uh, that everybody's brought together in a different way because the old way wasn't working. And there's a recognition that some, you know, some some pretty important uh, companies and institutions that the the, the, the past three years didn't actually um, solve the problem and in some ways, you know, hyper focus on identity differences, uh, surprise, surprise, has balkanized uh, <laughs> organizations and has uh, reinforced certain divisions and, and resentments. So they're trying new, new, new tactics, which, you know, is always, you know, welcome news whenever I read that. I can't gauge it myself because the institutions that I'm within, I tend to know you know, I'm there because there are some individuals and in decision making capacities who basically have stood up to some of the pressure mm -hmm. from people that would very much not like me to be there. Basically, at every institution other than AEI I think, <laughs> that I'm involved with, there are people that would very much want me not there, but I'm there because sure. there are people that have said no. But for me, I've always felt that that's a very tenuous situation because there's no guarantee that those people will always be there. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, so yeah. it's hard for me to gauge within the institutions where I am. Yeah. It, and, and now I feel like I, I need to go further in qualifying perhaps my optimism. I, I definitely <laughs> view, I definitely view the preservation and maintenance and even expansion of a free society, not as a given, but as, as part of a, a kind of forever war. 
Like, we will always have to defend these ideals and values. We've always had to defend these ideals and values. I think for much of my life, um, certainly in, as a child of the 80s and 90s, um, I had uh, an expectation that we were kind of at the uh, end of history, to use a rather fraught phrase, and that there was a consensus about these things and that these values had won out and you know we, we'd be able to relax. I can distinctly remember having a conversation with a friend uh, who's a prominent journalist who uh, we were at a bar. Uh, he was a little inebriated and he was upset. And he said um, of commenting on the cultural milieu, I thought mm -hmm. that we'd handled all of this stuff. I mean, I'd love to write and talk about something else. And I remember right, saying right, to him, right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we, we gifted you this world that is so, so much better than the one that came before it, but that you still have to do something in order to keep it and mm -hmm. to ensure that it will go on into the future. And, and knowing that, it will always be the case that there will always need to be a vanguard who is interested in defending particular ideals and values. Like, it's hard for me to, to, to be particularly pessimistic about the fact that I have to, you know, partake in the same project, the same philosophical project that, you know, John Stuart Mill was in, engaged in, <laughs> Elijah Lovejoy was engaged in. It just, it just is the case. Um, and yeah, we have to hope that the right sort of people are there and we have to make the arguments over and over again. I think the alternative is not, you know, a, a, a utopian world where everyone agrees on these things and gets it. And we just kind of move on to the next grand project. Um, I think the alternative is a kind of scler sclerotic situation where um, mm -hmm. less and less people actually understand the values. They certainly lose the ability to argue in favor of them because there was always this presumption that we knew all along what it was. And then you're open mm -hmm. to charlatans who will sell you discrimination and tell you that this is moral progress. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. there you know, are no permanent fun. victories. Yeah. Yeah, you have to ma maintenance is the word you use. It's like um, when mm -hmm. you think about these like Venice or these coastal cities where like it's Venice is nice, but uh, yeah. if you don't keep the water at bay constantly, you're going to lose That's Venice. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. maybe Ent these ideals and values thing. are nice, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess that makes me feel more optimistic just when you situate the problem that way, when you phrase it that way. It's like this is a project that we believe in and we can participate in. And I kind of, dispositionally probably go in the direction of your friend just like i read you know some some older friends i have leon weaseltier or um you know i was just talking with cornell west a couple of weeks ago it's like you look back at what some of these guys were writing and arguing in the 90s yeah. uh skip gates and these people they were having exactly the same yeah. debates and conversations and that used to kind of depress me but the way you phrase it it makes me think well well, yeah, they were, and those were important debates and conversations. And now our generation is participating and upholding and fighting the good mm -hmm. fight, as as our friend Yasha Monk phrases it. And that's like dignified and important work to be involved in, as opposed to thinking that you get you eke out a permanent victory and then you just like max out and relax with your feet up. That yeah, that makes me feel, already talking to you has had this effect on me <laughs> of making yes. me feel more optimistic. Look at look yeah, at that, look at what my, you do. <laughs> my good work for the day is done then. I, I mean, I, it's funny. I mean, we're we're in this era of a kind of identity obsession, and people talk about having pride and all sorts of immutable characteristics and things that they happen to be. But there's something incredible, undeniably noble, about being a part of a philosophical project that extends beyond you. Certainly beyond the span of your lifetime, um, looking forward or backwards, there is a continuum of people who have championed these ideals and these values for these particular reasons, because they believe it is for the good of humanity. <laughs> the, the yeah, let me prospect. ask you yeah. this then. Like, where do we go from here to continue to make progress and not just to, to do maintenance? Because you, like me, are actually mm -hmm. one of the very few people that goes beyond simply criticizing a hyper focus on identity and actually argues um, that uh, categories of race, for example, um, need to be fully rejected and are not meaningful and actually are harmful. And we need to imagine a future without race. Uh, that's a very minority position that you and I actually both, um, I think, um, 
probably bonded over realizing that we were the only guy in the room <laughs> <laughs> willing to willing to state it that way. Uh, uh-huh. Do you see us making progress on that front? Are we still yelling into the void? <laughs> um, you know, I published a book about this in 2019. I can't tell. I mean, I, I on an individual level, you know, people write to me, but I can't tell that the needle of the culture has moved at all. Um, where do you feel about that? Are we on the right trajectory? I'm of I'm of two minds about it. Um, I definitely we're definitely doing the right thing and ought to be making the case for you know new new moral vistas to be um, taken right. Like we want to mm-hmm. expand the horizon of what's possible. We want to dream a better dream than than Dr. King's dream. We can honor Dr. King's dream while being ambitious. Um, I, and and the way I've described this in other contexts is to say. Um, I think what you and I do is we hear like the speech and we nod along and he says, I, I dream of a day when little white girls and little black, black girls can play together. And what you and I know um, that Dr. King perhaps didn't know in the no. same way is that there are no little white girls and little black girls. They're just, they're just children playing together. And we want them to be able mm-hmm. to be, be seen as fully dignified and fully human in that particular respect. And that doing mm-hmm. that doesn't rob us of the ability to talk about things like racism and other problems that may exist in the world, but it does uh, kind of give us a different moral context for engaging with these individuals. It does place right. individual dignity as the as sort of centerpiece of our project. And yeah, that has to be explained and it has to be articulated and argued for the way any new idea does. Um, and it is entirely possible that by the end of our lifetimes, after all of the, the time spent writing and talking in public, it'll feel as though our ideas won't win out. Um, that said, this is a, a, a project that goes beyond the scope of our lifetimes. And I am, right. I am perfectly right, right, right. comfortable with the circumstance where I'm you know, laying the foundation and making the case for something that pushes beyond what most people are comfortable with or even understand. I don't expect right. most what people can you- to understand it. <laughs> But I hope at Can some point. Can you make the case really will. quickly? You, you, yeah, you define yourself as a race abolitionist. What is the, Kinda, the case yeah. you're making, the point I, you're making? I, I've said that somewhat tongue in cheek. Um, <laughs> and I've said all sorts of, of, of things in that respect. But fundamentally, I'm making a case for the dignity of the individual. And to, and to distill mm-hmm. it to a word, it's a case for individualism. And in much the same way that one argues for free speech as kind of a bulwark of a free society, my perspective is that individual dignity is the appropriate foundation for almost all of the conversations we have about rights today that are primarily framed with respect to identity groups, for example. Um, There is this question of whether Black Lives Matter um, or All Lives Matter, I should say, is a slur of some sort is kind of absurd, right? Like ultimately Mm -hmm. that is the, the fundamental position and any other the derivative of that like has to ladder into it. It's not negating mm-hmm. the lower point, lower order point. Um, it enhances it in an important respect. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I actually don't know if I answered your question well. <laughs> well, you were asking just, me to make the I case. Mean, my, I think the way I've always said it was, and I 100% agree with you that the individual gets short shrift in all these conversations and and lost in a way that is difficult to to tolerate but i guess the way i always put it is that i just don't believe we'll ever be able to transcend racism so long as we keep reproducing um the categories of race so long as we believe that these categories are what's most important and cannot Mm -hmm, be mm -hmm. transcended um, I think that's, I think that's made, fundamentally you know, true. Too. Yeah. Allusion to that with, with, with the idea of little white girls and little black girls. It's like as, as, as long as you actually believe that those are the categories and that um, there are ways to inhabit them better or worse, right. you're still reproducing something that's inherently hierarchical and, and, and debased with a kind of uh, slave logic that, that can't be reformed. Um, yeah. So the, I the, think that, uh, yeah, I think the, that that's the fundamental stumbling block and why anti-racism will never get us to that like future without racism, so long as it reinscribes race. You can't get anti-racism while maintaining right. race. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is this is Barbara Fields um, and others have done mm-hmm. like, 
fundamental, fundamental work of fundamental importance to kind of understanding the dynamic here that racism precedes race, that it, it invents mm -hmm. it as the mm -hmm. category in many respects. It, it requires it. Um, and again, these are, these are ideas that are not widely known or understood as a, res as a result. We kind of have to explain it. Um, but plenty of people are uncomfortable as, as a matter of principle with the notion of racial right. discrimination for whatever reason. And I think that suggests to me that, you know, there's an opportunity there. It's, it's, Perhaps in large part, like our project is, is about codifying these things and normalizing it and hopefully like putting it in words and forcing it into contexts uh, that allow people to really understand what's going on. Um, I can distinctly remember an experience where I was at a conference in Denver and a young uh, professor like, got up and asked a question about, um, he was a, a jazz he taught with about jazz and he mm -hmm. did not look like you or me. And he was concerned about the fact that he is more likely to agree with like a John McWhorter or Glenn Lowry than plenty of other people. But he had to, he felt like he had to keep quiet about this. And he was asking you know, if he was <laughs> doing the right thing. And the answer mm -hmm. that he received from the speakers at the conference was keep your head down and get tenure. And I know why they gave that advice and I understand it. And self-preservation is a worthwhile consideration, but it seems like that is the wrong advice to me, that the, the appropriate mm -hmm. advice, the thing that we ought to be trying to encourage people to do is to think about how far they can push the envelope. Um, how, how, how close can you come to, or what's the best version of your argument that you can make in this context that makes it likely that you will not offend other people completely and make it impossible to make progress, um, but that you can be earnest and honest about what you actually mm -hmm. feel, um, have a possibility of making a, a good case and sort of save your hide. And I think, you know, a tactical approach to these things is totally appropriate and reasonable. It's, it's sort of a SEAL Team 6 approach to <laughs> you get in, you save the hostages, you murder the terrorists, and everybody comes home get safe. Get out. Yeah, everybody comes home safe. Everybody Maybe comes helicopter, home. Helicopter, but everybody comes home safe. <laughs> You know, most of the time you won't get canceled. Like most of the time there's mm -hmm. people in the room who agree with you forcefully. And it's a question of what tactic you'll imply, you'll apply. Um, but the, the mm -hmm. goal, mm -hmm. the project of just keeping your head down and hoping things don't get too bad, only, only two things so far as I'm concerned are likely to come about from that. At some point you'll betray your values um, mm -hmm. and you'll go along. And at some other point, someone is going to challenge you and say, hey, why aren't you speaking up and why aren't you endorsing our horrible, convoluted, morally mm -hmm. reprobate and disgusting ideas? And, and when you don't respond, that'll be interpreted mm -hmm. as you mm -hmm. being a bad person. Um, so make the case, stand your ground, defend it. Um, the, the, the worst probably won't happen. Um, and there almost certainly is some productive um, effort that can be made on behalf of these values that you claim to hold. If you, if you have these values mm -hmm. and they matter, you ought to be willing to defend them, full stop. Well, yeah, I mean, it does remind me what you're saying about um, you know, being willing to stand up for your values and you probably won't get canceled, but you might. And it's, it's something that our mutual friend, Glenn Lowry has pointed out, you know, being, someone who stands for something is necessarily taking a risk. Mm -hmm. You can't have it always. You can't like, you know, think that some controversial ideas matter and that they need to be defended. And then also think that there's no chance that, you know, you can ever um, get uh, harmed at all in mm -hmm. defense of them. I mean, it's kind yeah. of, it's kind of an unrealistic um, conception of what it means to be someone who takes a stand. And once he put it that way, I thought, you know, that's true. This idea that, you know, um, ideas and values that are in the process of being contended, that mm -hmm. that's like a, um, a no contact sport. Um, maybe that's just, that was always an unrealistic way to approach, uh, uh, the dynamic and it would be better for everybody if people understood that this is a contact sport and that sometimes 
you know, you take every precaution, but sometimes someone blows an ACL or something. Yeah. You know, actually like <laughs> that's good. Defensive things that matter uh, is not something you can do completely risk free. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just nobler for everybody maybe to acknowledge that from the jump. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that I think that's right. We need uh, uh, we need more courage. Um, we need more empathy. Like, those are the things that that I kind of worry about marshalling even more than I do ensuring that people you know, get the sophisticated arguments with respect to speech and such. I mean, those are actual preconditions mm-hmm. for getting there. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, some of those things may be lacking on Twitter for different reasons. Um, but if we are committed to trying to put those, push those values forward, and if we can get sufficient distance from the platforms and interact with them a little less frequently, as I, I do think is generally a good idea, um, then yeah. we can be beacons on those platforms and perhaps occasionally punching bags, um, but beacons on those platforms <laughs> for the kind of ideas and values that we care about. And that's, that's, it's the reason I haven't left. Um, I, I barely there, um, relative yeah, to you tweet less than people you in our, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm barely there. I guess. I, and I think that's good. It's healthy. Like you should dip in, right. have a couple of things to say when you're spending, you know, a a tremendous amount of time there and it becomes almost kind of compulsive and it's always on. It's bad for Elon Musk. And I mean, it's good for Elon Musk and it's bad for you. Uh, But that is true. Yeah. (laughs) Like popcorn is great in in moderation, you know, even if you've got lots of butter on it. Um, But but once you (laughs) eat too much, like this is a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Camille. It's always good to see you. So good to talk to you, man. Yeah, and it's always always um, great to talk with you. Keep fighting the good fight. Yeah. Same. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>